Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar in the ATA Engineering Webinar Series. Today's webinar is Engineering for Electromagnetic Compatibility in Aerospace and Defense Electronics. Uh, your presenter this morning is Dr. Daniel Kinnaman from Siemens Digital Industries Software, an expert in electromagnetics. I am your host, Scott Tebow from ATA Engineering. A few uh, housekeeping uh, items before we get started. Uh, during the uh, webinar, uh, all the participants, uh, aside from the speaker, will be muted. But when we get to the Q&A at the end, if you have a question you would like to ask aloud, uh, just send a quick note into the chat or the Q&A, and we will, excuse me, we will unmute you so that you can ask your question. Uh, you can also ask questions during the webinar itself. You don't need to wait until the end. Uh, you can type those into the Q&A window or into the chat window. Uh, either one will work and we will try to address those uh, when we get to the end of today's presentation. Also, today's webinar is being recorded. So if you are not able to stay for the entire session or you have colleagues who were not able to join us today who you think would be interested in this material, uh, refer them to the same registration link that you use, which can be found at ata-e.com, and they will either be able to watch the recorded webinar right there or can get notified of it when it is available. So again, thank you for joining us today for this webinar on engineering for electromagnetic compatibility in aerospace and defense electronics. As we get started today, I'd like to give a quick introduction to who ATA is. ATA Engineering is a, uh, an engineering consulting company headquartered in San Diego, California. We are an employee-owned small business with a full-time staff of around 180, pushing 200 at this point, principally uh, comprised of degreed engineers with a high percentage of advanced degrees and PhDs. We are subject matter experts in the area of advanced test and analysis with recognized experts uh, who have been uh, recognized by the National Academy of Engineering, Society of Experimental Mechanics, and many more. We specialize in helping our customers overcome the most challenging uh, engineering problems in aerospace and defense, robotics and controls, industrial and machinery and mining equipment, consumer products, and even themed entertainment. Think uh, roller coasters, uh, theme park animatronics, and other types of uh, themed entertainment. We serve these customers from our offices across the United States. Our headquarters is in San Diego, California, as I mentioned. We also have offices in Los Angeles, the Bay Area, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Denver, Colorado, Huntsville, Alabama, and the Washington DC area, actually Herndon, Virginia. We are experts in design, analysis, and test. And in the process of uh, gaining all of this expertise in design, analysis, and test, we've also become a Siemens Platinum Level Value Added Reseller. As a Siemens Platinum Level Solution Partner, we provide uh, licensing and support for a wide range of Siemens products, including the SimCenter 3D high frequency electromagnetics products we're going to be looking at today. These products include NX, NASTRAIN, VMAP, Star CCM Plus, SimCenter 1D, SimCenter 3D, Team Center, and many others. Uh, notably, uh, ATA essentially did write the book when it came to SimCenter NASTRAIN. The SEM Center uh, NASTRAIN training materials are in fact written and uh, updated by ATA Engineering and a lot of NASTRAIN classes are taught by ATA Engineering engineers. We also uh, have a hotline support uh, capability for all of our uh, Siemens products and can help you with software implementation and software integration. We are recognized as a certified expert partner with Siemens for products such as FEMAP, Star CCM Plus, and today, the subject of today's webinar, SimCenter 3D. 
On our website, you can find a variety of useful resources. Uh, these include white papers, presentations, uh, recorded webinars, et cetera, uh, where we provide information on all the products we sell, including SimCenter 3D. Today's speaker is Dr. Daniel Kinneman from Siemens Digital Industry Software. Dr. Kinneman is the Technical Product Manager for Electronics for Siemens Digital Industry Software and manages the high-frequency electronic simulation products within the SimCenter simulation and test portfolio. So Daniel, I'll turn it over to you to tell us more about SimCenter 3D high-frequency electromagnetics. All right, thanks, Scott. I will share my screen. And I think we're ready to go. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this webinar on uh, engineering for electromagnetic compatibility in aerospace and defense electronics with some center 3D high frequency electromagnetics. Um, besides giving you an introduction to uh, the SimCenter portfolio with focus on SimCenter 3D and its capabilities, of course, in terms of uh, electromagnetic simulation, I want to uh, show live in the software parts of the streamlined workflow for EMI on a wire harness topology integrated in the uh, fuselage of, of a UAV. So engineers and manufacturers are always in search for answers about how their designs will perform. So historically, this has been done through physical testing of expensive prototypes mostly. Um, companies have long recognized basically that physical testing alone takes far too long, is far too costly and um, limits also the amount of innovation that can be achieved. So with the rise of um, computers, simulation technology, um, it's, it's really not, not really a surprise that engineers are looking to get answers to their questions digitally now, rather than um, physically with prototypes. So much cheaper to simulate a digital twin of your aircraft, and it's basically easier to make design changes before anything is really implemented and built. Um, it also means that you can try many more iterations, uh, permutations of your design concepts, and um, yeah, truly find the right design that uh, best meets your requirements. Historically, simulation engineers have been siloed, of course, uh, based on their functional domains and the simulation tools they use. Uh, engineers can perform simulation for a wide range of physics phenomena uh, now, but each domain has, of course, historically, um, a specific set of software tools specifically for that particular domain. Uh, user inf interfaces, uh, processes, data files, um, vocabulary, all of this is completely different most, in most of the times. So more co uh, col collaboration and integration among analysts and uh, software tools is required to better predict how products will perform. And that's basically where uh, SimCenter 3D engages and pushes together all of these formally separated domains. So SimCenter 3D begins with a common engineering desktop that forms the uh, central hub basically, where the, the user drives the simulation process by creating the simulation models uh, for the various uh, physics environments. Then uh, simplified models for the different environments can be linked, and this is uh, particularly interesting, associatively to a master part. Um, the engineering desktop is based on NXCAD technology, so well above basic uh, modeling capabilities and a very powerful env environment that basically can handle most complex geometries. Um, SimCenter 3D then delivers simulation for structural vibration, um, dynamics, durability, additive manufacturing, build processes, electromagnetics, of course, uh, microstructural and multi-scale material modeling all in one um, simulation platform. We also do a thermal and flow, uh, occupant safety motion and acoustic analysis. And since these solvers are all integrated through the engineering desktop that I mentioned before, it's also much easier to conduct and streamline multi simulation processes. The integrated solution also helps to, um, yeah, basically automate and efficiently perform design space exploration. Um, that is commonly done with um, a separate tool that is called uh, HEATS. 
And the, fall, and, and the focus of this presentation here um, is SimCenter 3D high frequency electromagnetics. However, um, the, Sim, the SimCenter portfolio covers also uh, low frequency electromagnetics and EDA dedicated PCB level signal integrity and power integrity analysis uh, software tools. And besides that, with Star CCM Plus, there's also a tool available to couple electromagnetics to absolute high end CFD and thermal simulation. So, just a short peek on what SimCenter 3D high, uh, low frequency is all about. Here we cover typically energy conversion problems such as e machines, transformers, uh, actuators. These can be coupled with either motion analysis or thermal analysis directly in the same environment. Beside energy conversion, uh, SimCenter 3D low frequency covers certain sensor applications that uh, yeah, operate in the low frequency domain. Uh, typically, these are capacitive, resist resistive, or inductive sensors. We can uh, simulate wireless power transfer over commonly very short distances. Uh, a typical application would be uh, inductive heat, basically. In SimCenter 3D high frequency, we cover uh, component to platform level uh, applications. So for antenna design, that means you can design your antenna in SimCenter 3D or map the pattern from a data sheet, create an array from that particular antenna design and install that array or that single antenna in a platform such as a plane, a car, et cetera. We can analyze how the antenna works in the array and even steer it taper its excitation, for example. So um, for example, to, to optimize uh, the pattern further with this. Uh, on that platform, we can analyze how the pattern changes due to its interference with the platform itself. Uh, we can also do cosite analysis. That means uh, we can ev evaluate the interference between multiple antennas in the same platform, or we can enter, uh, for example, a ray dome workflow to optimize the antenna housing and see how uh, it operates when, for example, the radome is soiled, wet, or covered with ice. Uh, radome analysis naturally also includes uh, material characterization. In most recent applications, also uh, in terms of metamaterial design, uh, that also goes by the name of uh, frequency selective surface design, FSS. Uh, FSS is something that we are not supporting at the moment, but it will be integrated in the near future. Uh, please contact us if FS, FSS, uh, frequency selective material design, is something that you're interested uh, about so we can uh, channel the demand here. Then we have um, the global topic of electromagnetic compatibility and interference. It is based mainly on wire harness, EMC, EMI, so um, electromagnetic compatibility uh, and interference. That means you can basically import a harness uh, coming from, for example, capital harness software, and then uh, simulate the interference in regard to susceptibility to external aggressors, so external sources attacking that wire harness, crosstalk, so the source is inside the wire harness and it crosstalks to other wires in it. And of course, emission, um, the internal source, of course, excites an electromagnetic wave, and that wave is emitted from the wire harness. We can analyze uh, the electromagnetic field distribution, power density, and also coupling, not necessarily um, in the combination with a wire harness. So that typically includes applications such, such as high intensity radiated field, HIRF analysis, and of course, uh, lightning strike simulation. We can do uh, electric structure network, ESN, and electrical wire interconnection system simulation, EWES, to determine, for example, um, the grounding network capability or grounding network quality. A topic that is not yet available, but uh, we are again looking into integrating it uh, is a radar cross-section, RCS simulation, uh, hotspot analysis and scattering. Please, if you are interested in that, let us know so we can again channel um, the demand for it. So uh, now to get an impression of how the software looks like and feels like, I will uh, live show, show a demo 
of uh, the streamlined wire harness electromagnetic interference workflow on uh, the fuselage of a UAV. Uh, let me give you a very short introduction to the topic. So here you can see the drone fuselage and um, the wire harness, which is here graphically represented as a simple uh, spline network. Each branch of the spline network underlays uh, wire harness electrical data, basically. So it's not just a spline or um, a wire, but each spline represents a, a bunch of, of, of wires in a certain interconnection with each other. The arrangement is included, uh, shielding, isolation, electrical connectivity, et cetera. Now we will go ahead in the demo and analyze the susceptibility of that harness to an external aggressor, meaning an aggressor outside of the harness, but inside of the fuselage and see that we can um, basically improve the susceptibility to it with adding uh, shielding to the harness topology. And afterwards, we will look uh, at how to simulate crosstalk on the same harness. So um, with that, let me switch to the software. Okay, so um, this is our drone fuselage. It's um, the empty model. And the first thing when you have created your uh, MCAT data is you need to import the harness. We have the uh, cable harness manager for that. The harness file uh, comes from uh, our tool Capital. It's an XML format. You give that harness a name and click import, and the harness topology as a spline network is created into the MCAT. If that is not aligned, you can of course align the MCAT with your harness. In my case, I did that before. So that is basically the step you need to take to import the harness topology into your model, align it, and you're good to move on basically. Um, just a couple of words to our file topology in SimCenter 3D. So as a base underlaying part, we have the CAD data, the model. On top of that, we create a linked part, which is the or a linked file, which is the so-called FEM file. In the FEM file, we create the mesh, the boundary conditions, set up the physical properties. And then afterwards, when this is finished, we can create a ZIM file to set up the, sim, uh, the simulation basically with the excitation, the solver options and create the solutions that we want to solve. So I've created these uh, files already and meshed part of it, but we will walk through um, the steps to create basically um, the harness model. So I jump to the to the FEM file and I can see that my harness has been introduced. And the first thing that I now need to do is I need to create um, a cable list. That cable list basically includes the information of the wires that are included in my harness. So in, what you can see here is basically all the individual wires that are included in certain branches of the harness. There are not only single wires, but also uh, wires that have a certain topology and arrangement to it. There's one thing to do. I need to create, or I need to set up the shielding values because these are not exported from capital. So my shield shall have a thickness of 0 0.1 millimeters and an outer radius of two millimeters. We will have an optical coverage of 0 0.95, weave angle of 30, and we will have 10 strands. The electrical conductivity is the one of copper. And we can take a look at how the transfer impedance of that um, shield will look like. 
notice that the transfer impedance gives you an impression on the shielding effectiveness. When, the, when this uh, transfer impedance is low, it is more effective. So we will have a decent shielding in the low frequency range, then a, a dip, and then for higher frequencies uh, up, starting basically somewhere at a couple of 10 megahertz, uh, the shielding effectiveness will uh, decrease. This is based on the parameters that we fed into the simulation, but also based on the nature of how uh, electromagnetics for high frequencies work. Let's take a look at the cross section. This is how this will look like. And we see everything is fine. The cable list changed its status from um, in progress to complete. So we have finished our setup here. The next or the last thing that we need to do is we need to mesh, of course, the topology. And this is especially simple because we are having only a representation of a one dimensional structure here. We can use a 1D mesh, choose a certain size, 20 millimeters, select all, control A, press OK. And our topology, our, our harness is fully meshed. With that we can move on to um, the ZIM file and create our physical model, our electromagnetic physical model for the simulation. Here we need to create a so-called harness model. We click OK and we include the cable list. I had two in the prior file. I will choose the second one. This is the one I just set up. Create model. And you see that there is quite some things to do. So this setup is basically to uh, choose how connections between branches in your wire harness should be handled. Each of these uh, entries here correlates to a certain part of the harness. So you can see that when I move on, parts of the harness are highlighted and each branch that is depicted here corresponds to a certain part of the harness. What we need to do now is to set a ground reference for it, for each branch. And when this is done, choose how the interconnection, so the interconnection between branches should be handled. We can choose between an ideal circuit an ideal interconnection or uh, various other, other options. Because this is only available when you have set up basically the ground reference for all branches, I will jump to a already set up model here. So let me go, okay. Let me jump to set up model. So in this case, I have done all of this already. And you can see here that these nodes can be chosen as an ideal inter, uh, interconnection or an interconnection via a circuit. So you can apply a resistor, capacitor, whatever, also a touchstone as parameter format to handle interconnections. Um, termination nodes need a certain termination uh, circuit. So you can choose a standard 50 ohm uh, termination, a short circuit, an open circuit, uh, a matched circuit. So this will um, um, prevent reflections at the end. And you can choose a certain circuit setup that um, you can take basically from uh, whatever connection or termination you will have there. So if you have, for example, an amplifier connected to your uh, to your harness, you can measure the, the input impedance of your of your uh, amplifier and then feed uh, the measurement data as as parameters in terms of a circuit termination node to this model. So this is basically how you set up um, the electrical model of your wire harness. And what is the excitation source in this case? So. 
um, I have in this case created uh, a, a, gener a, a generic uh, excitation source, which is uh, an electric dipole at this position. That electric dipole is located with a point, has a orientation, uh, a certain length and a, a current that will oscillate across it and excite our simulation domain. We can also handle, for example, uh, synthetic antenna models. So if you have um, uh, a certain device in your fuselage that you see as an aggressor for the harness topology, it is possible to model the field pattern, for example, from a, from a data sheet, map that into a synthetic antenna model, and then have uh, that particular pattern as an excitation source for your EMCMI harness analysis. Um, in this case, of, I went with a, with a generic excitation. The base solution that you always need to create is the electromagnetic um, solution. And the results in terms of harness susceptibility are then post-processed from uh, this base solution, basically. So in this case, I want to present um, a result from the wire harness simulation. I'm opening it right now. So this was um, obtained from that particular source that was coupling into that branch of the harness. And we can see that here in terms of current in uh, dB ampere, we can see that for low frequencies, we have a very significant uh, current coupled into that branch of 56 dB ampere. So this is quite high. And for higher frequencies, so of, on the X axis, we can see um, the frequency. We see that the current that is coupled to that wire is reduced significantly. But in the low frequencies, we have a significant problem. So what I did is, we or what we did is, we introduced a shielding to that wire harness. So I'm going to jump to a different model here where we have, uh, introduced a different harness model. So we have added shielding to the harness. And we did that simply by um, setting a certain option in the export from Capital Software, where you can say our harness should have an outer overshielding. And that overshield looks like this. So here we have a cable bundle and around that cable bundle, we added an overshield. That overshield is added to, the, to that branch as a parent um, entry. And we can now set up how that shield should um, yeah, would, how that shield should be treated basically. And again, I'm going to set up the shielding values that I've um, set up prior also uh, into the cable list here. We give the shield a certain thickness. In this case, it's a little thicker than before. The last time it was 0 0.1 millimeters, but we give it a larger outer diameter to fit all the other cables inside that over shield. We select a certain optical coverage, a weave angle. This is for basically um, the, the web that the, that the uh, shield is comprised of, the number of carriers again, and uh, the conductivity. We can take a look at the uh, transfer impedance here. And we see that the transfer impedance is quite low. It's significantly lower than before, but as the nature of it, it increases uh, with frequency. So we added shielding to that.
let me show how the results change through that. So um, the initial results were these for that particular branch and with shielding, we can see that the results have significantly changed, especially for the low frequencies. So from a very high coupling value with shielding or with that particular shield, we obtained a significantly lower coupling for the low frequencies, a low, significantly lower uh, induction of current. And for high frequencies, we are also reduced the coupling of the current. So this is also already a significant improvement. However, of course, um, shielding or from shielding, you would expect a result like this. So what happens if we change the properties of our shield? So is it possible, for example, to improve further, to reduce the coupling for higher frequencies? So you can do that by taking a look at the uh, transfer impedance, obviously, which is presented to you in our uh, harness model. So in this case, I changed the properties of the overshield. We had in uh, prior, we had a thickness of 0 0.25 millimeters and we had a significantly higher electrical conductivity. Um, these properties that I fill in here result in a significantly higher transfer impedance. So we have worse uh, shielding effectiveness for lower frequencies, but we can tolerate this because we are pretty good for low frequencies already. We are at minus 167 dB. So we can, we can um, compromise on a significant on a, on a little bit higher coupling for low frequencies if we can reduce the coupling for higher frequencies and that particular transfer impedance you can see here that it creates a dip there is a dip of transfer impedance starting from a couple of 10 meg, a couple of 10 megahertz to a couple of 100 megahertz here so we would expect from that shield a uh, a lower efficiency, so a higher coupling current value for lower frequencies, but a small reduction for higher frequencies. So let's take a look at the results. So here we see the results on the same branch. You can see here the name of the branch. It's exactly the same wires. And as I, as I explained before, we, we see a, a reduction of shielding effective, effectiveness for lower frequencies, but for higher frequencies, we can see that we have gained roughly 10 dB. So in conclusion, with the introduction of the transfer impedance to this setting up of the wire harness with the setting up of the harness model and the shielding, uh, you can prior to running the simulation already determine what you can expect of the simulation and then verify in the simulation itself. So I think that is uh, quite a nice um, benefit that you can get here. Another topic that I want to um, take a look at is crosstalk analysis. For that, you need to create first an internal aggressor source. You can do that by creating a dedicated crosstalk solution. And then you will, be, you will have access to the so-called harness wire excitation source. The wire harness excitation source that I set up here is attached to a certain branch of your harness. And with the connection via the harness model, 
you can uh, you can um, excite a certain wire of your of that of the of a wire that is uh, basically inside uh, the harness topology of that particular branch. So in this case, I applied a voltage of 100 volt to that particular wire here. And we can now take a look at how that excitation source will crosstalk to other wires everywhere in the wire harness. So I want to introduce um, a solution here. So we have run um, the crosstalk analysis simulation, and we saw uh, that we will that we have a certain value over frequency of uh, current coupling. Of course, we can also take a look at voltage coupling. We can take a look uh, uh, at common uh, mode currents, common mode voltages, differential voltages, all of this is possible in logarithmic scale, linear scale, etc. However, in this case, it makes sense to take a look at currents in the, uh, with a logarithmic scale. So how can we um, improve the, the, the shielding or the, how can we shield our, our harness against that internal aggressor that is our harness excitation source. Let's take a look first again at the harness model. And in particular, at that branch that we take a look at the results of this. So that branch is always RN8 to RN9. We see here that this is a, a conglomerate of wires over over a ground plane, but none of the wires is shielded whatsoever. There are a couple of, uh, these are, this is an indication that these wires are, um, are twisted, twisted pairs, um, but none of these wires have a particular shield. So how does the coupling behave when I add shielding to these particular wires. For that, I'm jumping over to um, a model where I introduced shielding to, um, to the wire harness. So let me show how that shielding looks like. So again, I'm taking a look at RN8 to RN9 branch. And in this case, I have one wire, one twisted pair that has a shield around it. Again, I can, uh, basically the shield data in this case goes not into the harness model, but into the uh, cable list in the FAM file. So that uh, shield is predetermined. And what I did here, I grounded that shield. So I need to find uh, the termination nodes basically of that shield. I'm going to do this now. So there is one because it's denoted as circuit. I'm gonna show uh, how that wire is basically set up. So in this case, we see here the cable shield as cable shield. And that one is connected to the shield of the attached node. And the circuit behind it that was used is a simple connection to uh, one ohms of all the wires. So a simple one ohm termination and the shield itself is simply grounded, full to ground level. Of course, if you leave the shield uh, floating, it will not have the same shielding effectiveness as if it was grounded. So I grounded it to really add shielding effectiveness. 
let's take a look at the results with shielding. So I have pre-prepared them. I open again. So these are the initial results of the unshielded harness. And these are the results of the shielded harness. I left one wire that is not in the shield inside the graph. It's in both graphs. So that wire is um, the 552. So wire W970552 is outside the shield. And in both cases, of course, it has quite a significant current coupling to it. But with the shield, we can see that the wire 554, which lies in the shield, has a significantly lower coupling to it due to the shield. And this gives you an impression on how shielding can be pre-evaluated before really implementing the wire harness as a prototype, because you can, of course, change the thickness of your, heart, of your shield. You can change the properties of your shield to optimize it to a shielding effectiveness level that suffices your needs. And of course, in a way, gives you um, good flexibility, basically. What, else, uh, what other results can you draw from such an electromagnetic simulation? So typically, these are the results that help you the most evaluate the electromagnetic interference of an aggressor, internal or external, to a wire harness topology. If you want to know how, for example, your fuselage will radiate due to the surface currents that are created from the internal aggressor, you have the opportunity or the chance to simulate a surface current, a surface current distribution analysis, basically. Surface currents are more or less a, a qualitative indication on which parts of your fuselage radiate. So you can animate the currents as well and gain insight of parts that are more susceptible to coupling, for example. You can choose various frequencies for it. And of course, this solution, that Post-processing solution is also available if you want to simulate a lightning strike, for example, and from that determine the path on your fuselage that is the most susceptible to um, energy coupling to um, thermal exposure due to the high current density on the surfaces. So typically surface currents are the result we can put out. Beside that, you can also take a look at the harness uh, emission results, which are the current distribution results on the harness itself. So in this example, um, you can see how the surface currents on your harness propagate, and you can see which parts are more susceptible to emitting energy by evaluating the current surface density. And you will notice that one part, which is this one here, has no current densities at all. So this one is fully um, shielded because in that particular harness topology, an outer grounded shield was applied to that mesh. Of course, this is also available for um, various frequencies. Okay, so with this, I would like to conclude my talk on uh, wire harness electromagnetic interference analysis on a UAV. 
and uh, I'm open to, to answer questions if there are any. Very good, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we are running right up against our time limit here, but there may be a couple of questions in the chat and uh, maybe uh, you could uh, let us know about those, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first off, thanks for those of you who have already submitted questions. Please continue to put those either in the chat or in the Q&A tab. Um, first question for you, Daniel, just you know, what solvers are supported? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I have not talked too much about the uh, solver technology, so um, I will uh, maybe take a couple of words to that as well. Um, so in SimCenter 3D high frequency, we are deploying a boundary element method. That means we are um, only required to mesh the surface of our structures uh, and no volumetric mesh is required. That is very beneficial to structures that feature a, a high a space to boundary ratio. So we have a lot of free space, a lot, uh, just a few boundaries. Then these methods are commonly the most effective, which is uh, mid to large scale scenarios. And on that uh, boundary element method, we can run uh, full wave solvers, which are um, 3D method of moments solvers with um, fast multiple uh, acceleration, which well gives you for models that are electrically large, um, a good efficiency and a good ratio to computational resources required to solve these models. Um, if it gets even larger in a way that a full wave approach is not feasible anymore, we also have um, the unified theory of diffraction solvers, so optical solvers based on diffraction, as well as an iterative physical optics solver that is um, utilizing um, basically surface currents, but from an optical point of view. And we can also deploy uh, ray tracing solvers for um, Channel modeling, for example, is a typical channel modeling applications. Uh, we are using a, a, a backward ray tracer, which is particularly uh, effective when, when it comes to um, simulating ray tracing, basically. Then for uh, PCB level simulation, we can use a 2.5D MOM solver. And for um, when it comes to lower frequencies, or electrically uh, small models where uh, typically a uh, method of moments solver are not too effective anymore. We have an S-peak solver, which utilizes basically uh, equivalent um, electrical models uh, to solve. So I hope this, um, this whole, I hope this answers the question. Yeah, I, I appreciate the detail there, um, very good, thanks. Um, possibly the final question, um, could you just comment a little bit on how SimCenter 3D electromagnetics handles soiling on radomes? Yes, yes. Um, so uh, when it comes to radomes, typically it's typically water or uh, moisture, ice on, uh, on a radome significantly deteriorates the performance of the radar. It causes reflections. It has, for high frequencies, quite a high permittivity. So reflections are uh, amplified by that, basically. And in most cases, um, the thickness of these moisture layers is quite high. And all of this can be handled with um, our boundary condition method, which features a multi-layer approach. So what we do is um, you can set up a boundary condition that is called multi-layer. And that multi-layer gives you the opportunity to stack up elect uh, conductive or dielectric layers up to 16 on top of each other. 
For example, if you want to uh, simulate therefore a ray dome, it makes perfect sense to stack your soiling layers with a multi-layer approach and just add uh, as many layers as you want of, of, of particular materials that are soiling your, your radon. So for ice, it makes sense to have one on ice layer or uh, for, for, for rain, it makes sense to have um, maybe a droplet pattern on top of the radon. But of course, a continuous film is, is possible as well. Um, uh, it's also possible, this is um, a particular ni nice feature, it's also possible to add that multi-layer uh, surface boundary condition to an already dielectric uh, volume boundary condition. So if you have, for example, uh, a, a ray dome thickness that exceeds the thickness that you can handle with a multi-layer surface boundary condition then it's still possible to model that, that uh, thick boundary, that thick ray dome dielectric boundary with a volume, but add on the surface the, the soiling, the, the, the moisture, the, the, uh, the, the ice layer with an additional multi-layer um, boundary condition. And that is, I think, particularly nice because most radomes, of course, are uh, highly transmittive. They are made to transmit the energy and therefore uh, they're typically dielectric, so dielectric volumes. And to, to be able to add these soiling with an additional multilayer method is particularly nice, I, I suppose. Great, thank you. Um, Scott, I think that wraps up all of our questions. So back over to you. Very good. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speaker, uh, Dan, Dr. Daniel Kinneman from Siemens Digital Industry Software. Thank you very much, Daniel, for a very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot, Scott. If you would like to uh, get further information about SimCenter 3D High Frequency Electromagnetics, you can contact me I work at ATA Engineering Southern Regional Office in Huntsville, Alabama, but I'm happy to talk to customers nationwide who might be interested in this technology. Thank you for joining us this morning for this webinar on high frequency electromagnetics modeling in SimCenter 3D. Again, as a, by way of reminder, this session has been recorded. It usually takes a couple of days for the recordings to become available but you would access the recording through the same registration page you originally used to sign up for today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.